Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Then when we discuss the symbolism of intellectual property in science, okay, I, I must reiterate that there must have some way of thinking about the distinctive equivalents in the domain of science of income and, and wealth and property found in the economic domain. Okay. How do scientists manage to perceive one another simultaneously as peers and as unequals? in the sense of some being first among equals. What is the distinctive nature of intellectual property in science? <coughs> okay. It is also a part of the, the, the way the world of science is structured okay. uh, in, the, in, uh, in the hitherto existing most important mode of production that is capitalism. Okay. <clears throat> as you uh, as as is well known that there are various modes of production there are various stages in the development of societies ranging from the hunting and gathering economy hmm. it is also popularly known as uh, uh, the primitive eco, uh, prim, primitive communism or primitive communist society or prim, primeval communal society okay i am not using primitive because it is also a colonial construct that is that's a different story altogether okay let us use these terms hunting and gathering economy means the slave society the feudal society and the capitalist society okay which marx envisioned that which will unstoppably and unavoidably okay move on to uh, uh, socialism and thereafter communism that is uh, these their different cases altogether okay uh, which which are very important in 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 the context of social theory but in the context of STS that we are discussing here, okay, we will we'll discuss the way scientists manage to perceive one another simultaneously as peers on the one hand and as unequals on the other in a capitalist structure. And the world of science is also not an exception to this, okay. is no exception to this. In the sense of being uh, in the sense of some being first among equals, what is the distinctive nature of such intellectual property in science? Okay. Intellectual property in science, okay, it is also hi historically conditioned. Our last module, uh, well, last towards the end of our lectures, entire course, okay, we will find intellectual property rights regime. Um, uh, uh, in the world as well as in the context of India. Okay. Then cognitive I mean when but, but in its generality I am talking about intellectual property in science in the context of ownership over scientific knowledge, restriction of scientific uh, uh, and technological developments uh, for public use okay, uh, and so on. And the cognitive wealth in science is the changing stock of knowledge, while the socially based, uh, uh, the the socially based uh, psychic income of scientists takes the form of uh, pellets of uh, uh, peer recognition that aggregate into uh, reputational wealth. And this conception directs us. Okay, directs, directs us uh, to the question of the distinctive character of intellectual property in science. Okay. It is a seeming paradox okay, uh, uh, which we started with Merton's 
work on uh, cumulative advantage in science okay mm, uh, that once private property is established by giving its substance away for in a long standing social reality only when scientists have published their work and made it generally accept accessible preferably in the public print of articles monographs and books that enter the archives does it become legitimately established as more or less securely theirs okay we st i mean martin started with that that for in a long standing social reality i mean uh, i mean it is a paradox in science that once private property once intellectual property is established by giving its substance away by giving he or her research away okay by uh, letting others know about that distinctive research okay for in a long standing social reality only when scientists have published their work of repute and made it generally accessible preferably in the public print of articles monographs and books i mean in the form of publications that enter the archives does it become uh, at, at that time only it becomes legitimately established as more or less securely theirs and what we mean by the expression of scientific contribution that is an offering that is accepted however provisionally into the common fund of knowledge common property uh, of uh, of resources okay what is common property resources again is different from this word common fund but but we'll discuss that thing later okay when we discuss ipr regime intellectual property rights regime as such okay okay then when we we say that the 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 scientific contribution when we talk about scientific contribution which refers to an offering that is usually accepted but provisionally into the common fund of knowledge who suggested this first that if it is accepted if our hypothesis is tested right you must corroborate it it you must accept it provisionally because under all other circumstances we have not tested our hypothesis to be right or wrong okay and one one single instance may test your hypothesis wrong that's why we must keep our scientific contribution okay in the form of acceptance but provisionally into the common fund of knowledge okay communism i mean that that crucial i mean if common fund of knowledge if we look at that crucial element of free and open communication is what martin uh, uh, described as the norm of communism in the social institution of science um, uh, if you uh, can uh, slightly recall we discussed the ethos of modern science i mean namely universalism communism disinterestedness and organized skepticism okay in this sense that crucial element of free and uh, open communication is what martin uh, described as the norm of communism in the social institution of science i mean ethos of modern science okay imperatives of science with bernard barber going on to propose the less connotational term communality indeed long before the 19th century okay marx uh, adopted the watchword of a, of a fully realized communi communist society from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs this was institutionalized practice in the communication system of science okay uh, i mean what marx said i mean if uh, if you go back to the stages in the uh, development of society or the modes of production which we discussed i mean hunting and gathering economy slave society feudal society uh, uh, and then capitalist society which will unstoppably uh, uh, move on to uh, um, socialism and thereafter communism okay the the way marx suggested that hunting and gathering economy uh, was an uh, was based on some kind of community relations 
private property i mean ownership uh, over many resources by a few individuals by a few groups okay in fact originated through the slave society okay through the slave society and feudal society and now capitalist society okay what is the difference between the slave society the feudal society and the capitalist society on the one hand and hunting and gathering economy and socialism and communism on the other the slave society the feudal society and the capitalist society they are class societies whereas the first the hunting and gathering economy and the last two i mean socialist society and communist society they are not they are not class societies what are classes according to marx that we have just now discussed classes according to marx are manifestations of economic differentiation classes are not based on uh, 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 or classes are based not on income but on the position that one occupies or the functions that one performs in the process of production okay you will not find for, for that's why i gave you this example for there for example there are two blacksmiths one an owner and the other a paid worker then both belong to two different classes not one okay you will not find that kind of a relationship okay in in hunting and gathering economy or uh, in socialist society or in uh, communist society for marx okay then what is the difference between hunting and gathering economy on the one hand and socialism and communism in, on the other hunting and gathering economy was not an organized economy was not an organized society where the production was not organized okay whereas in socialism and communism okay production is organized somebody may say that in capitalism also production is organized yes capital in capitalism production is organized in socialism production is organized in communism production is organized okay but the ownership that you find in capitalism in the hands of a few individuals or a few groups or a few elites okay that ownership will be transferred to the state okay uh, or the or the proletarians or the working classes okay in socialism and communism then what is the difference between socialism and communism then martin is astute in mentioning here is quite incisive in mentioning here that in socialism each will be contributing according to his or her capacity and will be paid according to his or her work okay i mean in socialism each will be contributing according to his or her capacity okay or ability and each will be paid according to his or her work whereas in communism each will be contributing according to his or her capacity and will be paid according to his or her needs okay that's why uh, long before i mean the 19th century uh, uh, long before the 19th century marx uh, adopted the watchword of a fully realized communist society uh, from each according to his abilities or uh, to i mean work to each according to his or her needs this was an institutionalized practice in the communication system of science okay in fact in fact this is very important to understand this okay uh, i mean when we look at this that the transition from from uh, each according to his ability uh, his or her abilities to each according to his or her needs okay uh, this is not a matter of human nature or nature given altruism that's why communism is an institutionalized practice in the communication system of science this is not a matter of human nature or or of nature given altruism okay 
institutional arrangements have evolved to motivate scientists to contribute freely to the common wealth of knowledge according to their trained capacities, just as they can freely take from that common wealth that they need. Moreover, since a fund of knowledge is not diminished through exceedingly intensive use by members of the, of the scientific collectivity, indeed it is presumably augmented that uh, virtually free and common good. Okay? Then the such, such institutional arrange, arrangements, okay, which have evolved to motivate scientists to contribute freely to the common wealth of knowledge, common fund of knowledge as we have discussed earlier, according to their trained capacities, just as they can freely take from that common wealth what they need. Moreover, since, uh, since, uh, since uh, fund of knowledge, since a common fund of knowledge is not diminished through exceedingly intensive use by members of the scientific collectivity, indeed it is presumably augmented that virtually free and a common good is not subject to the tragedy of the commons. Okay? It is an environmentalist argument, the tragedy of the commons. Uh, uh, we can discuss uh, as a, as a not not as a prefatory remark, but but what is uh, when we when we will wrap up this this discussion, we'll discuss common. Uh, I mean uh, the tragedy of the commons. Okay, I mean in fact the power over uh, those common that that common fund of knowledge. Okay, uh, or the power over uh, resources, the power over common property resources. Okay, the power over natural resources. Uh, has in reality been translated into the power over people. Okay? Uh, I mean, what, what uh, the tragedy of the commons is a term uh, coined by uh, uh, Garrett Hardin. Okay? Uh, I mean, first the erosion, what is, what is that the tragedy of the commons? I mean, first the erosion and then the destruction of a common resource by the individually rational and collectively irrational exploitation of it. Individually rational and collectively irrational, individual profit, but collective loss that is tragedy of the commons. In the commons of science, it is structurally the case that the given the take both work to enlarge the common resource of accessible knowledge. Okay? Then, I mean, are you able to follow uh, what I mean? That that the the kind of uh, the, that 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 is that since uh, of common fund of knowledge is not diminished through exceedingly intensive use by members of the scientific collectivity. Of course, it is presumably augmented by. Uh, virtually free and common good, okay, uh, which is not subject to what Garrett Hardin has aptly analyzed uh, as the tragedy of the commons. The tragedy of the commons, I repeat, I mean, uh, it refers to first the erosion and then the destruction of a common resource by the individually rational and collectively irrational exploitation of those resources, common resources. Okay? I mean individual profit and collective loss, individual profit and social loss, individual profit and national loss. Okay? And in the commons of science, it is structurally the case that the given the take, given the take I mean the quid pro quo system, given take relations. In the commons of science, it is structurally the case that the given the take both work to enlarge the common resource of accessible knowledge. Okay? The structure, the, 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 the structure and dynamics of this system are reasonably clear. Since positive recognition by peers is the basic form of extrinsic reward in science, all other extrinsic rewards 
such as monetary income from science connected activities, advancement in the hierarchy of scientists and enlarged access to human and material scientific capital derived from it. Okay? But obviously, peer recognition can be widely accorded only when the correctly attributed work is widely known in the pertinent scientific community. Along with the motivating intrinsic reward of term, okay? I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, along with the um, the motiv motivating intrinsic reward of um, working on a system scientific problem and solving it, this kind of extrinsic reward system provides great incentive for engaging in the often arduous and tedious labors required to produce results that enrich the attention of qualified peers and are put to use by some of them. And this system of open publication that makes uh, for the advancement of scientific knowledge requires normatively guided reciprocities. Okay? We have already know, know, we have already discussed what is the normative institutional framework of science, structure of science okay? in the context of ethos of modern science. It can operate effectively only if the practice of making one's work communally accessible is supported by the correlative practice in which scientists who make use of that work acknowledge having done so. In effect, they thus reaffirm the property rights of the scientists to whom they are then and there indebted. This amounts to a pattern of legitimate appropriation as opposed to the pattern of illegitimate expropriation that is called plagiarism. Okay. Then, when we look at this system of open publication, which makes for the advancement of scientific knowledge that requires normatively guided reciprocities, normatively guided framework. Institutional framework, institutional structure. Okay, it can operate effectively only if the practice of making one's work communally accessible is supported by the correlative practice of making one's work. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, it can operate effectively only if the practice of making making one's work communally accessible is supported by the correlative practice in which the practitioners of science who make use of that work acknowledge having done so. In effect, they reaffirm the property rights of the scientist, I mean intellectual property rights of the scientist, of the practitioners of science to whom they are often then and there indebted. And this amounts to a pattern of legitimate appropriation of as opposed to the pattern of illegitimate expropriation as is seen in the case of plagiarism. Okay. We thus begin to see that the institutionalized practice of citations and references, I mean what is, what is that plagiarism? I mean when you uh, quote somebody without acknowledging the source, okay. you cite somebody without acknowledging the source. Okay. And as part of the intellectual property system of science and scholarship, okay, I mean we will, uh, I mean we, we then begin to see the institutionalized practice of citations and references in the sphere of learning okay, is not a trivial matter, it is, it is very important. While many a general reader that is the lay reader located outside the domain of science and scholarship may regard the lowly footnote or the remote end note or the bibliographic parenthesis as a dispensable uh, nuisance, it can be argued that these are in truth central to the incentive system and an underlying sense of distributive justice that do much to energize the advancement of knowledge. Okay? Then as, as part of the intellectual property system of science and scholarship, references and citations serve two types of functions. One is instrumental cognitive functions and secondly symbolic institutional functions. One is instrumental cognitive functions, I mean it must have an objective and symbolic okay, that you acknowledge the source. Okay. 
the first of these the first one I mean the instrumental cognitive functions okay? it involves directing readers to the sources of knowledge that have been drawn upon in one's work. Okay? This enables research oriented readers if they are so minded to assess for themselves the knowledge claims the ideas the findings in the cited source to draw upon the other pertinent materials in that source that may not have been utilized by the citing intermediary publication uh, and to be directed in turn by the cited work to other prior resources that may have been obliterated by their incorporation in the intermediary publication. Okay? But, citations, but citations and references are not only essential aids to scientists and scholars concerned to verify statements or data in the citing text in, in the in, uh, in the citing of texts or to retrieve further information. They also have not so latent symbolic functions. They maintain intellectual traditions and provide the peer recognition required for the uh, uh, required for uh, the effective working of science as a social activity. Okay. Then Merton tried to uh, look at many works in fact okay, uh, of Newton and others and then uh, and then uh, the kind of study that that Merton along with uh, 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 Harriet Jackerman carried out. Okay. They have taken a note of how Henry Oldenburg, the editor of the newly, I mean, the, the editor of the transactions of the uh, Royal uh, uh, Royal Society in 17th century England, induced the emerging new breed of scientists to abandon a frequent long-standing practice of sustained secrecy and to adhere instead to the new form of free communication through a motivating exchange, open disclosure in exchange for institutionally guaranteed honorific property rights in the new knowledge given to others. That, that historically evolving set of complementary role obligations has taken uh, deep institutional root. A composite cognitive and moral framework calls for the systematic use of references and citations. As with all normative constraints in society, the depth and consequential force of the moral obligation to acknowledge one's sources become most evident when the norm is violated and the violation is publicly visible. Okay? If you do not cite some sources, okay, uh, then it amounts to plagiarism, uh, it, is, uh, it amounts to unethical conduct in science. In research, as such, the failure to cite the original text that one has quoted at length and or draw upon becomes socially defined as theft, as intellectual larceny, or as it is better known since uh, at least the 17th century as plagiary. Plagiary involves expropriating the one kind of private property that even the dedicated abol abolitionist of private um, productive property as as uh, Martin uh, uh, mentioned, Karl Marx passionately regarded as inalienable as witness his preface to the first edition of Capital and his further thunderings on the subject throughout that revolutionary work. To recapitulate the bibliographic note, the reference to a source is not merely a grace note affixed by way of erudite ornamentation. That is, that it can be so used or abused does not of course, negate its code uses. The reference serves both in uh, both I mean the reference serves both instrumental and symbolic functions in the transmission and enlargement of knowledge. Instrumentally, okay, I mean both instrumentally as well as symbolically. Okay. Instrumentally, it tells us of work we may not have known before some of which may hold further interest of us on the one hand and symbolically it registers in the in the enduring archives the intellectual property of the acknowledged source by providing a 
palette of peer recognition of the knowledge claim accepted or expressly rejected that was made in that source. Intellectual property in the scientific domain that takes the form of cognition or, or sorry recognition by peers is sustained then by a code of common law. This provides socially patterned incentives apart from the intrinsic interest in inquiry for attempt in do good scientific work and for giving it over to the common wealth of science in the form of an open contribution available to all who would make use of it, just as the common law exacts the correlative obligation on the part of the users to provide the reward of peer recognition by reference to that contribution. Okay? I mean what I mean Martin tried to look at this, I mean such such intellectual property in the scientific domain provides socially uh, patterned incentives apart from the intrinsic interest in inquiry for attempt in good in do good in doing good scientific work and for giving it over to the common. I mean this this research may be very intrinsically uh, uh, influenced, but, but the kind of rewards uh, the reward system, the kind of uh, ownership pattern that it has, okay, it is extrinsic in nature, okay, not intrinsic. Okay. Thereby, he, he tried to uh, go on that how uh, 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 intellectual property in science provides socially patterned incentives, okay. now, apart from the intrinsic interest in inquiry for attempt in doing good scientific work and for giving it uh, over to the common wealth of science in the form of an uh, open contribution available to all who would make use of it, just as the common law exacts the correlative obligation on the part of the users to provide the reward of peer recognition by reference to, to that contribution. That is why uh, Martin uh, tried to provide certain examples like did space allow which happily for you it does not, I would examine the special case of tacit citation and of obliteration by incorporation or the obliteration I mean of the sources of ideas, methods or findings uh, by their being anonymously incorporated in current canonical knowledge. Okay. Many of these cases, okay. many of these cases uh, of seemingly acknowledged uh, uh, or many of these cases of seemingly unacknowledged intellectual date, it can be shown uh, are literally exceptions that prove the rule that is to say there are no exceptions to all since the references however tacit are evident to knowing peers. Once we understand that the sole property right of scientists in their discoveries has long resided in peer recognition of it and in derivative collegial system, we begin to understand better the concern of scientists to get their first and to establish their priority. That concern then becomes identifiable as a normal response to institutionalized values. And the complex of and the complex of validating the worth of one's work through appraisal of competent uh, others and the seeming anomaly, even in a capitalistic society of publishing one's work without being directly recompensed for each publication have made for the growth of public knowledge and the eclipse of private tendencies toward holding private knowledge, I mean that is secrecy. Okay. Secrecy is scorned okay, in science, uh, I mean should be scorned. Okay still much in evidence as late as the 17th century. Current renew, uh, renewed tendencies towards secrecy and not alone in what uh, Henry Escovis has described as entrepreneurial science will uh, if extended and prolonged introduce, uh, introduce major changes in the institutional and cognitive workings of science. Since Merton has imported not altogether metaphorically such categories as intellectual property, psychic income and human capital into this account of, a, of, of the institutional domain of science, 
it is perhaps fitting to draw once again upon uh, chief of the tribe of economists for a last word on our project okay on the, on on the project which merton carried out okay let me quote uh, uh, merton here that himself an uh, in uh, inveterate observer of human behavior rather than only of economic numbers and also himself a practitioner of science who keeps green the memory of those involved in the genealogy of an idea uh, paul samuelson clearly cleanly distinguishes the gold of scientific fame from the brass of popular celebrity this is how he concluded his presidential address uh, uh, i mean uh, uh, i mean uh, almost uh, uh, 20 30 years ago what uh, i mean i mean in 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 63 60, 62 or 63 I, um, uh, in 1962 or 63 that uh, uh, let me quote paul samuelson here as quoted by uh, uh, merton not for us is the limelight and the applause of the world outside ourselves but that doesn't mean the game is not worth the candle or that we do not in the end win the game in the long run the economic scholar works for the only coin worth having our own approach okay i mean then 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 it is very important important to understand that once we understand the the sole property right of the practitioners of science in their discoveries has long resided in peer recognition of it and in derivative collegial system we begin to understand better the concern of the practitioners of science to get there first and to establish their priority that concern then becomes identifiable as a normal response to institutionalized values okay when i say institutionalized values i mean the complex of validating the worth of one's work through appraisal of competent others and the seeming anomaly even in a capitalistic society of publishing one's work without being directly compensed for each publication have made for the growth of public knowledge and the eclipse of private tendencies toward holding private knowledge okay that is secrecy still much in evidence as late as the 17th century okay and then then what we have discussed till now we i mean in this module okay we started with the, the the inequalities in science okay in terms of the matthew effect in science the reward and communication systems of science okay uh, then we have discussed the matthew effect in its generality how psychosocial processes affect the allocation of rewards to scientists for their contributions an allocation which in turn affects the flow of ideas and findings through the communication networks of science and such conception uh, as uh, is based on an analysis of composite experience reported in jackerman's interviews with nobel laureates in the united states there we have discussed the reward system in science the matthew effect in the reward system the matthew effect in the communication system the matthew effect and the functions of functions of redundancy and the social and psychological basis of the matthew effect and the matthew effect and allocation of scientific resources and then after 20 years merton tried to provide an account of matthew effect in science not in the in the form of reward and recognition but in the form of cumulative advantage and the symbolism of intellectual property okay the cumulative advantage in science then we discussed intellectual property in science then the matthew effect in its generality then the way the the world of science is structured unequally okay uh, where at the bottom you find more scientists with a few rewards and recognitions and at the top you find a very few scientists with more rewards and recognitions the the world of science appears to be uh, unequally distributed okay that's why uh, we have discussed how a world is uh, how the world is peculiar in this matter how it gives credit it tends to give the credit to already famous people for example a prize will almost always be awarded to the most senior researcher involved in a project even if all the work was done by a graduate student okay then 
we have discussed accumulation of advantage and disadvantage among the young scientists, the junior scientists, uh, the graduate students, the, the PhD research scholars and so on. Then we have discussed accumulation of advantage and disadvantage among scientific institutions. Okay. Then we post then the then Merton the way he posed the question if the processes of accumulating advantage and disadvantage are truly at work, why are there not even greater inequalities than have been found to obtain. Okay. From there on Merton tried to look at countervailing processes and then the symbology mean of intellectual property in science. Okay. Then quickly we will try to first review okay, before getting into technology and politics. Okay. Then from the very beginning we started with the ontological questions concerning science, technology and society. Okay. I mean all philosophical questions. Okay. Uh, what is technology? Suppose technology is the medium through which human beings interact with nature. When I say nature, it includes both natural and social phenomena. Thereby, I try to widen the scope and ambit of technology. Okay. What is science? Science is an inquiry into the nature and limits of a particular knowledge. Okay. When I say lim nature, I mean uh, the scope and ambit of science. When I say limits, by limits I do not mean limitations, by limits I mean uh, under what limiting conditions science is practiced or pursued. Okay. Then we, uh, we discussed various uh, perspectives on the relationship between science, technology and society, okay. namely uh, uh, we started with the linear or hierarchical model, then the interactionist model and then embedded model. Okay. There we discussed how technology is not neutral, now, the neutrality of technology depends on the way a particular technology is designed and controlled. There we discussed uh, the construction of the New York Bridge by Robert Mosses in the 1970s, which reflect, I mean the design of that bridge reflects, uh, uh, the design of that bridge uh, of the New York Bridge itself uh, uh, reflects. Uh, uh, racial prejudice and class bias uh, on the part of masses uh, and then we discussed uh, from the ontological questions to to the the more normative questions what should be okay what ought to be okay there we discussed the normative structure of science by merton ethos of modern science namely universalism communism disinterestedness and organized skepticism. Okay. From there onward, what we did, but what is at stake today? Okay. The such inequalities which persist and those ethos of modern science are, are expected to overcome such inequalities in the form of, suppose in the form of community. And such inequalities in sci science we have discussed in terms of rewards and recognitions, in terms of cumulative advantage in the, in the form of in the in the in the form of symbolism of intellectual property and so on. Okay. From now onward, what we are going to do, we will discuss the way two processes, two, two forces of production, okay, namely technology and politics. When I say politics, you may you may uh, look at it as, as a combination of economic culture and polity, okay? Um, because when we when we discuss this, we'll we'll first start with technological shaping of society. It, it is a general common uh, view that uh, no, uh, as if uh, uh, technology determines what kind of uh, of an economy or a culture or polity we are going to have. Okay. As against this, we also have social shaping of technology. Okay. Uh, why we say that no, the technological shaping of society is not tenable, it is untenable precisely because if, if a particular technology 
determines everything. If computer determines the the way US is designed today, then the computer would would also have designed uh, 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 India that way. But they are different, right? I mean, it is a, a particular uh, technology also is incorporated in a specific social, economic, and political context, cultural context, institutional context, ethical context, legal context, ideological context. We are going to discuss these the, this this aspect okay, in the lectures to follow. Now, when we look at technology and politics and their interrelationship, okay, in controversies about technology and society, there is no idea more provocative that the notion that technical things have political property qualities or properties. I am I am banking on Langdon Winner's article, do artifacts of politics. Okay. At issue is the claim that the machines, structures and systems of modern material culture can be accurately judged not only for their contributions of efficiency and productivity, not merely for their positive and negative environmental side effects, but also for the ways in which they can embody specific forms of power and authority. Since ideas of this kind have a persistent and troubling presence in discussions about the meaning of technology, they deserve explicit attention. Okay. Now, let us see first technological shaping of society. What is, what does it refer to? What does technological determinism refer to? What does technological shaping of society refer to? Technological determinism refers to the fact that any kind of change which is happening okay, can be, must be, should be attributed to the way technology is incorporated in our economy, culture and polity. Then technology becomes the cause and changes in our economy, culture and polity, they become the effects. Okay. Now, for, for, the, for our understanding, okay, if this is the case, then technology will be a universal phenomenon. Okay. If technology is a universal phenomenon, becomes a universal phenomenon, okay, what kind of problems it can have? Okay, I'm not bringing about a critique to technology in the ways uh, uh, suppose uh, uh, a person uh, uh, from uh, from the world of theology can approach. Okay, I'm bringing about this critique to technology from the vantage point of STS, from the vantage point of philosophy of science, history of science and sociology of science. Okay. I am trying to bring about a linear model of, I am trying to bring about a critique to the linear model of the development of technology. Okay. In this case, how technologies can shape society? What is, how is how can a particular technology influence society? We have we have seen when computers were introduced in India, okay. India also faced so much of unemployment, okay, initially. Okay. But now we cannot think beyond computer, I mean we cannot think independent of computers. Okay. It is very important, okay. I am not denying, we are not denying that. What scholars of STS they have been trying to do they have been trying to locate technology in a specific social and political context. Therein lies the, the significance of such debate on how technology is politically maneuvered, economically determined, socially and culturally influenced and whether that is what we, we have already discussed whether a technology is neutral or not depends on the way it is designed 
and controlled. Okay. Neutrality of a technology can be judged by this, by these two aspects, whether a technology is, uh, how a technology is designed and how a technology is controlled, ownership. Okay. It is not simply important that how technology, what is, what is the, uh, the contribution of technology, uh, okay. the contributions uh, of, of any technological system may be seen in the form of efficiency and productivity, may be seen in the form of uh, or, or, the, or you can say that uh, a technology may be evaluated in terms of positive and negative environmental side effects. But more importantly, a technology must be evaluated in the ways in which a particular technology can embody specific forms of power and authority. Okay? In, in, in rudimentary sociology, there is a difference between power and authority as we have discussed earlier. Authority is legal, whereas power is not. Okay? But we are using these two terms interchangeably here for the time being, but keep this in mind that the power and authority they are not same. Okay? When we when we talk about this 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 specific form of such specific forms of power and authority embedded in in the designing and controlling of a technology, okay, then certain certain persistent and troubling presence in the discussions about the meaning of technology uh, uh, will be witnessed and perhaps for this reason it, it deserves explicit attention. If you, if you look at this Langdon Wiener tried to provide, uh, I mean he tried to uh, uh, look at Louis Mumford's article, I mean uh, in, in technology and culture which appeared in the 1960s, 70s, okay, that, that Louis Mumford gave classic statement to one version of the theme arguing that from late Neolithic in the near east right down to our own day, two technologies have uh, recurrently existed side by side, one authoritarian, the other democratic. Then how a particular technology uh, brings in the structures of power and authority we will see. Okay? One technology is authoritarian and the other is democratic. The authoritarian technology is system centered, state centered, is propagated by the state, is sponsored by the state, is immensely powerful because of, because of the because it because it has been sponsored by the state okay but inherently unstable okay it is because it doesn't take into consideration many other factors we'll come to this okay let us first see what is the other kind of technology okay a more democratic technology which is human centered, but relatively weak, but resourceful and durable. Look at the kind of uh, dam project related to, uh, large dam project related to Narmada Bacha Vandolan. Okay. That is a huge project, it is a system centered project dam. It was immensely powerful because it was sponsored by the state. Okay. It, it had uh, 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 it had the support of the state, but it ignored various aspects of people's rehabilitation, displacement and so on. People, human lives and living, they were disrupted because of that particular uh, uh, construction. In the northeast, you will also find uh, the construction of Subansri Dam. Okay? When you, when we look at these aspects, immediately we think that a, a particular technology has been designed in such a manner that it displaces the inhabitants from their habitat. It, we are, we are compelled to feel that, that 
certain sections of the society they have been marginalized because of the incorporation of such authoritarian technology. It may be system centered, it may be state sponsored, it may be immensely powerful, but inherently unstable. It is, it is, it is, it is not only lives and livings, human lives and living, but also the, the amount of natural resources which get disrupted. Okay? In, for, in the form of water, in the form of forestry, in the, all sorts of natural resources. Okay? The other, I mean the, the, the democratic technology, okay, which is human centered, it, it may be relatively weak, but resourceful and durable. And such argument stands at the heart of Mumford's studies of the city, architecture and the history of techniques and mirrors concerns voiced earlier in the works of Kropotkin, uh, 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 Morris and other 19th century critics of industrialism. Okay? I mean uh, you can look at many other things, I mean you can look at uh, uh, Charlie Chaplin's modern times, okay? uh, uh, you, can, you can read Henry Lefebvre's critique of everyday life. Okay? You see these, these seminal works, these seminal movies, okay, they also talk about how a particular technology may become very authoritarian in displacing people from, from its purview. Okay. If you look at uh, modern times by Charlie Chaplin, then you will find how a particular machine, it reduces the particular use of, uh, I mean use of a particular machine it reduces a human being into another machine. A human labor gets alienated from himself or herself okay, and gets reduced to another form of an artifact or a machine. Okay. Such, such is the inhuman, uh, uh, such are the inhuman considerations uh, uh, when we talk about uh, industrialism. Okay. In this sense, more recently we will find anti-nuclear and uh, pro-solar energy movements in Europe and uh, America have adopted a similar notion as a centerpiece in their arguments. Thus, environmentalist Dennis Hayes concludes, the increased deployment of nuclear power facilities must lead society towards authoritarianism. Indeed, self-reliance upon nuclear power as the principal source of energy may be possible only in a totalitarian state. Echoing the views of many proponents of appropriate technology and the soft energy path has contains that dispersed solar sources are more compatible than centralized technologies with social equity, freedom and cultural pluralism. Okay? In this context, what we find is that Suppose, if I, if I uh, give, you, give you an example, in the 70s, in the 1970s, in the 1990s and again in the 21st century what we have witnessed at least in India, India has gone ahead with nuclear tests in Pokhran and other places, especially in Pokhran. Is it a scientific question or a political question? That has to be settled. Even if that is not settled, one must raise the debate. We must debate the controversies. Okay? One, one may say that there is there is there is a uh, there is a similarity of opinion between the scientific community as well as the political elites of the country on nuclear tests. But the debate does not end here. Even the scientific community, the scientific authority and the political uh, power, powerhouses, political um, uh, establishments, okay, they are not unanimous on this question. Okay. That is why uh, the debate is still on, it, it is, is it a political question or a scientific question. Okay. It is important for, 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 a, for, a, for a researcher to understand the, the dynamics. Okay. That is why when we when we talk about the increase i mean i mean the way uh, has uh, 
pointed out that the increased deployment of nuclear power facilities must lead society towards authoritarianism. Indeed, self reliance upon nuclear power as the principal source of energy may be possible only in a totalitarian state. Hess contends that dispersed solar sources are more compatible with than centralized technologies with social equity, freedom and cultural pluralism. Okay? And, uh, and eagerness to interpret technical artifacts in political language is by no means the exclusive property of critics of large scale high technology systems. A long lineage of boosters have insisted that the biggest and best that science and industry made available were the best guarantees of democracy, freedom and social justice. The factory system, automobile, telephone, radio, television, the space program and of course, nuclear power itself have all at one time or another been described as democratizing liberating forces. Okay? But the way they embody power and authority that has not been captured so well, especially among, among uh, HTS scholars you will find that uh, how that this such, such notion uh, has been challenged. Okay.